out in Marvel Comics. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, always known as Forum BXC57, your friendly neighborhood 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe reviewer. And years ago, back when I had done G.I. Joe Vlog number 3, I had mentioned mini comics, which were pack-ins with the 1993 Balcor figures, which were the main basic line of G.I. Joes at the time. Now these, like bonuses or freebies, um, well, because they only came with 1993 figures, and I wasn't really up to those years just quite yet, I didn't have them to review. But I had recently bought this 1993 Balcor Iceberg, and lo and behold, it obviously it was just basically taken right off the card and opened, but one of the items included was the free pack-in comic. So this encouraged me to actually do a review of these mini comics. Now, there were only four of these mini comics. They weren't numbered in any way, and they aren't related to one another. So you didn't have to collect all four of these mini comics in order to get a complete story. These are contained little stories in each of these little uh, supplements here. Now, these little mini comics are actually rather small. I was actually rather surprised at how small they are. Here is a regular comic, just to uh, show you the size difference here. Now, of course, I am not familiar with mini comic pack-ins. It's not really unique to G.I. Joe, obviously. Uh, Masters of the Universe, and I think the Kenner's um, Superpowers figures, actually had like mini comics as standard with their uh, figures. So I'm not sure just how these kind of like stack up story-wise or even size-wise, really. And another interesting thing about these mini comics is that they're made by Marvel Comics. In other words, these aren't just some little independent thing which Hasbro cooked up. They actually do use some comic universe uh, elements in their stories. In no particular order, I'll start with Desert Dust Up. In this mini comic, the Joes are protecting an oil pipeline in the Emirate of Benzene, a made up Middle Eastern country first mentioned in the main comic G.I. Joe issue number 109. So I'm guessing this takes place between then and number 115. Cobra forces arrive to plant bombs on it in order to extort the Emir. Three Joes, Duke, Dusty, and Gung Ho, were already in the perimeter that Cobra sets up and counterattacks at night. The sneak attack is successful when Gung Ho moves Cobra's own bombs onto their tanks. While the comics are eight pages long, you'll notice that the story is only six pages. That's because the last two pages are dedicated to a Marvel Comics G.I. Joe six-month subscription order form. The pointing dusty artwork comes from issue number 100, and the fist-clenching Cobra Commander comes from number 98 if you're interested. There are several notable things about this comic, starting with Duke's appearance. He is wearing a boonie hat that no version of the toy ever had. It does look good on him and is appropriate for desert combat. Although the Emir does not appear in this comic, the level of distrust the Joes have for him is reflected here, carried over from the main comic. Cobra Commander calls what looks like 1990 Sonic Fighter Vipers, Heat Vipers. This would be the first comic appearance of Sonic Fighter Vipers if I wasn't sure whether it was an art error or a dialogue error. This is also the first comic appearance of 1992 Cobra Parasite personnel carriers. Next is the mini comic titled Hijacked Heroes. In this story, the Joes are being honored with a parade and showing off their new Patriot tank. Cobra Commander wants to steal the new tank and sets a trap that the Joes literally slide into. Thanks to Flint's quick thinking, he punctures a giant character float, letting it deflate and smother the Cobra hijacking force. The most notable thing about this comic is that it seems to be an homage to one of the Joes' earliest comics, number 5, Tanks for the Memories. I'd call it a pale ripoff, but they were both written by the same person, 11 years apart, so I'll give it some slack. Andrew Wildman does the pencil art, and it shows in the overly exaggerated expressions everyone has. I've already covered what I think of his artwork in my review of the main comic during the 90s. In addition, the coloration of everyone and everything is terribly inaccurate. This is the first appearance of the 1992 Fort America, and it's kind of odd that Cobra didn't try to go for this tank as well. Maybe they didn't recognize it being in orange. 
It's the first appearance of the 1992 Patriot tank, also in orange for no reason. Duke makes his first appearance in his 1992 outfit, incorrectly in green. Hawk first appears in his 1992 Talking Battle Commander's outfit, also incorrectly in green. 1993 Balcor Alley Vipers appear in what looks like 1994 Alley Viper colors. I'll assume this is a color error, since everyone else is colored wrong, and not a first appearance of a toy that wouldn't be released until the following year. Next is the mini comic titled Jungle Fury. In this story, the Joes uncover Cobra setting up a base in the upper Amazon. Snake Eyes, Stalker, and Muskrat can't attack in broad daylight with limited resources and the area full of natives forced to build for Cobra. They attack at night and force Major Blood and his cronies to retreat into the impenetrable and well-stocked blockhouse. But Muskrat flushes them out with dam water. The colors are off again, but not for characters or vehicles. Instead, it's the background that suffers. Remember how the Joes are supposed to be attacking at night? Well, it doesn't look like it at all. Here, it looks like Major Blood is staring at three tied up night creepers and wondering where they are at the same time. It should have looked like this. This is the first appearance of the 1992 Cobra Earthquake. You can barely make it out, but it's there which is really cool since its bulldozer design is appropriate for constructing the Cobra base. This is the first appearance of Muskrat in his 1993 Balcourt outfit without helmet. The first appearance of Major Blood in his 1991 Supersonic Fighters outfit. And the first appearance of 1993 Balcourt Crimson Guard Commanders, although not named as such in the story. The final mini-comic is titled Mountain Trouble. In this story, we are already in the middle of a battle as the Joes in a motorized battle wagon carrying a large mysterious crate are being chased by multiple Cobra Ice Snake vehicles led by Destro. Destro is after the precious satellite component that the Joes are bringing back to their HQ. After destroying a bridge, Destro is successful in making the Joes abandon the battle wagon and the crate it was carrying. However, it turns out that the crate was just full of rock and roll's dirty laundry, and the satellite component was small enough to fit in Cross Country's pocket and be delivered to HQ. I'm assuming these events take place after the main comic issue number 146, when Destro returns to Cobra, as much of the 1990s have Destro acting independent and later retired until being reprogrammed by Cobra Commander in the main comic. Notable in this issue is the appearance of the Cobra Transport Helicopter, a mysterious design that was never a toy, but appeared throughout the main Marvel comic run. Also, Heavy Duty appears to be wearing a construction hard hat for no reason, but I'm betting the artist mistook the character's backwards ball cap for one. This is the first appearance of Iceberg in his 1993 Balcor outfit, although he is colored as Caucasian in air throughout the comic. He is also incorrectly colored green where it should be yellow, but the original toy artwork also had that discrepancy. This is the first appearance of Cross Country in his 1993 Balcor outfit, although it's all over badly colored. You can still make out that he has lapels and not the vest collar of his 1986 version. 1993 Cobra Ice Snake vehicles make their first appearance. Destro appears in his 1992 outfit for the first time. And finally, General Flag III in his 1993 Belcourt outfit makes his first appearance, although he is not named. I must say that out of the four, Desert Dust Up is my favorite. The art is more than serviceable. The content is the closest to a main G.I. Joe comic published at the time, again, possibly between issue number 109 and 115, and characterization of each of the three Joes is great. Overall, it's rather hard to complain about these simple and tame stories, as I'm sure that Larry Hammett and Paul Kirshner had to comply with the same restrictions as the Starduster comics had. When published as a separate media, Comics can be evaluated as literature and include serious topics, like the ones the main G.I. Joe comic tackle. As soon as they are inserted into a different consumable, they must be strictly acceptable to the earliest age range the consumable is. 
just like the Starduster comics included in Serial meant for children 3 and up, so too are action figures for 5 and up, and the writing skewed to that. Still, given the small amount of pages for story development, there is still plenty of action, plenty of interesting characters and vehicles on display, and they don't detract from the main comic. If anything, they should pique the interest of young minds and point them towards the better main comic source. If you're interested in finding these four mini comics on the aftermarket, I would suggest buying them from sealed 1993 Balcor figures like I did. The loose mini comics I've seen for sale have been mostly miscategorized and sell for an inflated price. These comics are not rare and should not be valued at a premium. For basically the same price as a loose comic, you could get a sealed 1993 Balcor figure with one inside and just open it up. You get a mini comic and an action figure at the same time. It's also pretty easy to see which comic it is through the card backs bubble so you don't get a duplicate, unlike today's blind box trend. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for another 80s and 90s G.I. Joe review. See you then.